So welcome again to the End Times Prophecy Bible Study, and my name is Laura, and we are now on week 16. It's incredible to think that this has been four months of studying the Word of God, and He's showing us so much, and we are just so blessed, so blessed to be sitting at the feet of Jesus and to be hearing from the Holy Spirit and to be having these mysteries revealed to us. For the past three weeks, we've been um, doing a deep dive into these symbols that are presented to us in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, uh, which Jesus referred to um, in Revelation 1, verse 20, as the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. And the title of the mystery reveals the keys, which I believe will unlock the mystery for us. And the first key we discovered was the information that the seven stars represent seven angels. And as we studied the word stars and thought of them, oh, well, if they're angels, what does that tell us? We learned a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and I believe that that was in week 13 that we studied that. And we even discovered some things about the identity of the, um, the star that falls at the fifth trumpet and possibly identified um, when that fifth trumpet sounds. So that was kind of interesting. And the second key that we've been given was the information that the seven candlesticks represent seven churches. And so we uh, have been investigating those candlesticks, and I think that was in week 14. But the mystery itself is identified in the previous verse. And the mystery is the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And the more that we've been studying the Bible, the more that we see that the things that we can see with our eyes, or which are recorded as historical events in the Bible, are actually symbolic or metaphorical of deep spiritual realities. And once we understand the spiritual symbolism of the physical reality that we can see, we then start to discern the things that are. So in other words, the things that we see, what they represent what are, what is. And then we can discern the things which shall be hereafter. In other words, we start to see how that symbolism is being made manifest metaphorically during the time of the end. And um, and so that's why we're taking this deep dive and we've been discovering lots of things and I continue to discover things as I study. So it's very exciting <laughs> as we continue on with this study. So we covered a lot of territory and uh, some of that we'll be reviewing today, but I would really encourage you if you've not done so already to watch the previous studies in week 13, 14 and 15 so that you can understand the journey that we've been on so far. Okay, so last week we started to look into the symbolism of the crowns, which are given to the Church of Smyrna and Philadelphia. And just as our study of the candlesticks caused us to refer back to the tabernacle of the congregation built by Moses whilst Israel wandered around the wilderness for 40 years, we also discovered that there were three items located in the tent of meeting which had crowns of gold. And in fact, the first reference to crowns of gold is found in the book of Exodus. And last week, we studied the first item, uh, which was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant has a crown of gold. And the Ark was located behind the veil within the Holy of Holies. Within the Ark of the Covenant were the two stone tablets of the Law of Moses, a sample of the manna, and Aaron's rod. And on top of the Ark was the mercy seat, protected and covered on either side by two cherubim. It was from the mercy seat that Yahovah communed with Moses and with the high priest on the Day of Atonement. So um, just before we move on to this week's study, I just wanted to point out another crown of gold, which is a little bit hidden <laughs> in this description of the items that were involved in the ministry of the uh, tabernacle. 
But I think that we actually need to look at this crown of gold if we're really going to understand fully the symbolism of the Holy of Holies. And we find that crown in Exodus 28, where Moses is instructed into how to make the paraphernalia associated with Aaron, the high priest. So I'm wondering if I could have a volunteer, please, to read from Exodus 28. And we're going to read um, Exodus 28, verse 36 to 38. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and grave upon it, like the engravings of a signet. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace, that it may be upon the mitre, upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may be bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts and it shall be always upon his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. Amen. And so just to point out the difference between your version and the King James Version, the new King James Version left out what was written on the plate of pure gold. Okay. And what was written on the plate of pure gold were the words holiness to the Lord. So the words on the plate of pure gold are holiness to the Lord. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so here we have a plate of pure gold. Okay, it has words holiness to the Lord and it has it um, is tied to his forehead with a blue lace and it's called the mitre that it may be upon the mitre upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be it shall be upon Aaron's forehead so this really is a crown okay it's not called a crown but really it is a crown because it's it's pure gold and it's around the forehead and I believe that it's also um, the same crown of gold which we see on um the uh, the being which is upon the cloud in Revelation 14 verse 14. So if we go to the book of Revelation 14 verse 14, and I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the son of man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. So in other words, I think that when we come to study Revelation 14, we can now be fairly confident, fairly certain that the identity of the one who is sitting upon the cloud, remember Jesus will come on the cloud in the same way that he left, that will be the same way that he comes back. Like unto the Son of Man, Jesus referred him to himself as the son of man, having on his head a golden crown. And Jesus is our high priest. And just as Aaron, the high priest, had that crown, on that golden crown, that golden plate, that golden mitre on his head, um, this one who was sitting upon the cloud like unto the son of man, having on his head a golden crown, is, I believe, Jesus, our high priest. Okay. So I just wanted to uh, bring that out because everything that is behind the veil in the Holy of Holies is therefore a depiction of Jesus, our high priest, and communicates how Jesus' finished work on the cross has worked salvation and righteousness for us who believe. Only Jesus God's appointed high priest in the order of Melchizedek has been deemed holiness unto the Lord. He and he alone has permission to enter in behind the veil. But when a believer decides to believe in Jesus and to receive the mercy that was purchased by Jesus's atoning sacrifice on the cross, the veil between that person and God is torn, and the way is made for that person to commune with God directly, just as Moses communed with God, just as the high priest communed with God on the Day of Atonement. That person accepts the lordship of Jesus as their high priest within their hearts and minds, as represented by the rod of Aaron, and we saw that last week. 
the law of Moses, the two stone that was written originally on the two stone tablets. That law of Moses is written on the believers' hearts and minds by the Holy Spirit. And the believer receives the crown of eternal life, the crown of life, and the ability to hear with their hearts and to understand with their minds the word of God as represented by the manna. All of that is recorded for us in Hebrews 9 and 10. And unfortunately, we don't have time this week to read that. But I would really encourage you to read Hebrews 9, read Hebrews 10 in light of the things that we've studied last week. And I think that you will see that all of the things that we've been talking about are recorded in Hebrews 9 and 10. And these things will really sink deep down into your spirit regarding the symbolism of all the things that were in that Ark of the Covenant. Okay, but today I would like to focus on the three items which were within the holy place, the sanctuary, and that was within the tent of meeting, and the tent of meeting was within the tabernacle of the congregation. And those three items were the candlestick with the seven lamps, which is called the menorah, the altar of incense, which, as we're going to see, had a crown of gold, and the table of showbread, which, as we're going to see, also has a crown of gold. All three of these items were situated before the veil and needed to be tended to perpetually. As we meditate on these three items, I believe that we will unlock several mysteries, namely the symbolism of the daily sacrifice, it, which Daniel 8 tells us will be taken away. And we will also unlock the mystery of the identity of the two olive trees spoken of in Zechariah 4. So let's start our study of the holy place. And the first verse that I want to read is Hebrews 9, verse 2. <clears throat> and I think that I'll read that just to keep it simple. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And that was in Hebrews 9, verse 2. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at each of these item, items individually. We have already covered the candlestick and the altar of incense in our previous studies, um, which I think was week 14. Okay, so we've already um, looked at those two. So we're just going to review. But as we look at these items, I want to really also point out where in the sanctuary these items were located. And I want to point out how often these items were serviced, because those are very key words. And the menorah, the candlestick, was essential to providing the only source of light within the sanctuary, the dwelling place. Okay, For this reason, the Levitical priests needed to refill the oil supply for the lamps, both morning and evening, to ensure that the lamps never went out. And we read that in Leviticus 24, verses 1 to 4. Um, and so, would you like to read that? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel, that they bring unto thee pure oil, pure oil olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually. Within the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation shall Aaron order it from the evening unto the morning before the Lord continually. It sh shall be a statute forever in your generations. He shall order the lamps upon the pure candlestick before the Lord continually. Okay, so I wanted to pay close attention to where um, the candlestick uh, is located. So did people pick up where it is? Within the veil? Or without of the veil, sorry. Yeah, without the veil of the testimony, which I think 
yeah it's so it's in front of but yeah so it's so that you've got so you've got the holy of holies which is behind the veil and then in front of the veil you have the candlestick right mm -hmm. without the veil okay but then also um we also saw that aaron shall order it before the lord okay so that mm -hmm. is repeated twice that's repeated in verse three and that's repeated in verse four okay without the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation shall aaron order it from evening unto the morning before the lord and we mm -hmm. also see that in verse four he shall order the lamps upon the pure candlestick before the lord and how often shall he do it continually continually and we studied that word i think it was when we did the candlesticks which i think was week 14 that word continually is the word tamid and tamid yeah. is the hebrew word which daniel uses in daniel 8 11 and 12 which in the english has been translated as daily sacrifice okay but as we see here, the word sacrifice is not in the Hebrew. Tamid is simply the word perpetually, continuing, a stretching. Okay, that's what tamid is. And it was the tamid that Daniel said would be taken away. Okay, so here we see that what is being conducted tamid continually is the ordering of the lampstands from evening and morning. He shall order the lamps upon the pure candlestick continually before the Lord. Okay, so what does the, again, we're just reviewing. So what does the menorah symbolize within a believer? Any ideas? Uh, is it, is it um, Jesus, the middle one? The middle, it's a seven, is it that one? The seven um, branches. So, um, anybody want to respond to that? Yeah, I think um, there are two. There's, there's an eight branch menorah where Jesus is the servant light in the middle. Okay. Well, if yeah. we go to Revelation 1, mm -hmm. verse 20, I believe it is. Mm-hmm. We are told what the candlesticks are. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which they saw. The seven churches. Yeah. Yeah, the seven churches. Yeah, yeah. of course, of course. Absolutely. Okay, so the menorah has seven lamps mm -hmm. on it. And Jesus tells us the seven lamps are the seven churches. <laughs> that nice of uh, him to make it easy for us <laughs> right and so if you want to have jesus included on the lampstand that's why i think as ansel has pointed out there are some lampstands that have eight, eight. exactly yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. but if it's only seven jesus has told us that's the seven churches okay so but we identified that the sanctuary is the dwelling place of god okay we identified that in previous studies Okay, and we mm -hmm. know that we as believers are the dwelling place of God, right? God mm -hmm. dwells within us. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so we are the holy place. Okay, okay. So if the menorah is within us, what might it be a symbol of within us? us each of the, the 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 lamps the perpetually burning lamp within us a oneness with each other it be? we're going to get to that oh, but sorry. that's not it's not the lamp that's symbolizing that uh -huh. there is something within the sanctuary that symbolizes that but it's not the lamp um well, i think it's worship isn't it is incense. That would be on the altar of incense, Ansel, which you're right, absolutely, is within the sanctuary, definitely. But the mm. lamp, remember, the lamp church. is, sorry? Isn't the seven churches? Yeah. 
yeah. and it's and it's burning right yeah. and it's got oil right so the <sighs> oil is burning oh. right and it's shedding light I mean, I'll put forward my idea unless somebody else. My idea is that it's the perpetually burning lamp of the Holy Spirit. Uh -huh. And remember as well that there's seven spirits, aren't there? Oh, yes, of course there is. Mm -hmm. Because there's a verse there. Uh, have I got it? Yes. Okay. So actually, Revelation 4, verse 5. Mm. Yes, of course. The seven spirits of God. Wow, that's amazing. A Revelation 4, verse 5. In front of the throne, remember the candlestick is without the veil, okay? Mm -hmm. Before the Lord. In mm -hmm. front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God, okay? So the blazing lamps represents the Holy Spirit, okay? Which is blazing through the candlesticks, the candlesticks are the church. And who's the church? We are the church. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hallelujah. Wow, that's, a, that's, that's a revelation because it's, I, I forgot about the seven spirits. I mean, I only saw it yesterday, but I didn't equate it. Not forgot. I didn't equate it. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. All these verses, which are scattered around the Bible, but when you look at the tabernacle, they all come together like pieces of a puzzle. Here's another verse for you. Proverbs 20, verse 27. So jot this down so you can see it for yourself later. Proverbs 20, verse 27. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. That's Proverbs 20, verse 27. Daniel 5, verse 14, I have even heard of thee that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. So that was speaking about uh, Daniel, the prophet Daniel. And then Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bit bushel, but on a candlestick. Mm. And it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light, so you, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, is, which is in heaven. Okay? So the light is the light of God, which comes to us via the Holy Spirit. So we become the candles and then we are set on the lampstand, on the candlesticks, and we are before the throne. Okay, do you see all this imagery? It's going to continue. <laughs> okay, so that's the menorah. So the altar of incense. So now we're going to look at the altar of incense, Was the which was the second... Um, item, piece of furniture within the sanctuary, within the holy place, which was in front of the veil, and behind the veil was the holy of holies. Okay, and we're going to read, I want um, somebody please to read Exodus 30, verse 1 and 3. You shall make the, an altar to burn uh, incense on, you shall make it for Acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit adds width. It shall be secure and a two cubits shall be its height. Its horn shall be uh, what horn shall be of one pieces wide pieces with pieces with it. Uh, and you shall waverly its top its sides all around and its horn which pure gold and you shall make it for it a molding of gold all around okay amen okay so again um as i've said many times it's really important if we want to get revelation out of the bible 
that we read the King James Version because um, the point is, is that the words in the King James Version are each individual keys that track through the Bible. And the spirit of Antichrist doesn't want you to be able to do that. And so if you read any other version than the King James Version, you will not be able to get the revelation that you need. So the King James Version does not use the word molding. It's not a molding, okay? It is a crown. Um, so Revel uh, what were we? Exodus 30, verse 3. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof and the sides thereof round about and the horns thereof. And thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. Okay. And so we see here that, remember, we're trying to study this word crowns. Okay. <laughs> because mm -hmm. the church of Smyrna was given a crown of the crown of life. And the church of Philadelphia was told, don't let anybody take your crown. And the 24 elders were also wearing crowns of gold. Okay, so these are things, these, these crowns are important. We want to know about crown. And the way that we started on this journey was I thought, okay, well, let me just see where crown shows up elsewhere in the Bible. And I put in crown. And as I said, what I identified was that the very first time that you see crowns, <laughs> especially crowns of gold, is in the book of Exodus when Moses is being taught how to make the temple. And that's how we started down this journey. And I received so much revelation by tracking these crowns of gold. Okay. And so here we see in the sanctuary that we have an altar of incense, which has a crown of gold. And we're asking ourselves the question, do these items, do the fact that they have crowns of gold give us clues as to how maybe we can receive a crown of gold, okay? Or a crown of any type, <laughs> okay? And so basically that's what we're, that's what we're trying to study today. Okay, so I just wanted to continue on then uh, in Exodus 30 and uh, verses 6 to 10. And do you want to read that this time, Ansel? Okay. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning when he dresses the lamps. He shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon. And Aaron shall make an atonement for upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall ye make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. Oh, man. Okay. So remember, we're paying extra specially close attention to the location of these things. Okay. And so we see the location of where the altar of incense was. And that was in verse six. Mm -hmm. So Marjorie or anybody, do you, can yeah, you see? The veil. Before the veil, yeah. that is by the Ark of the oh, Testimony, yes. before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. Okay, so it's before the veil. Hallelujah. Okay. And the other thing that we wanted to uh, identify um, was how often it was serviced. Every, morning. Every day, twice a day, evening and morning. Yeah. And for how long was Aaron told to do that? So evening, morning, evening, morning, evening, morning, evening, morning. How long was he told to do that? Perpetually. Perpetually. Yeah. What's the word perpetual? It's, ooh, where can I find it? It begins with a T anyway. <laughs> Very well done. It's Tamid. 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 T-A-M-I-Y-D. And we identified that the Tamid 
is the thing that Daniel, Daniel 8 says will be taken away. <laughs> okay, so, and so in verse 8, we see that Aaron lights the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord. So there we have that phrase, before the Lord throughout your generations. And we saw that with the candlestick, that it was before the Lord. Okay. And we see that the incense, that this cannot be any old incense. Okay. Um, you shall offer no strange incense and that nothing else is to be burned on this altar. Okay. So this isn't an altar of fire on which you can do a burnt sacrifice or a meat offering or any of those other offerings. No, 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 no. This is strictly for burning incense, okay? And the incense needed to be kept burning whilst the priest was refilling the oil lamps every day. So every day, every morning, the priest went in and refilled the oil lamps, and the whole time they were refilling the oil lamps, they burned the incense, okay? And what does the incense represent? Our prayers, prayers. The prayers of the saints. And after we did our study on that a few weeks ago, I found this delightful verse, Psalm 141, verses 1 to 2. Lord, I cry out to you, make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't that beautiful? Wonderful. Because that shows that it is our prayers, but also the lifting up of our hands. What does that signify? Praise. Praise and worship. Our praise, praise and, worship, yeah. and worship, okay? Mm -hmm. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up of my <clears> hands <throat> as the evening sacrifice. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And so based on this imagery, what do we get a sense of in terms of how we as the sanctuary, as the Levites who are servicing our sanctuary, how we, what what sort of guidance, okay? I'm not trying to be overly prescriptive here, but are we getting any guidance here <laughs> in terms of how we should minister to the Lord? Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we should keep our, our lamp burning and we should pray night and morning. Hallelujah, okay? Again, without getting too prescriptive here, but there is something here, isn't there? that we are to have a morning sacrifice, a morning sacrifice of prayer and praise and an evening sacrifice of prayer and praise. And for me, I think what we're going to get at is, is this how we service the lamps? Is this how we ensure that the lamp of the Holy Spirit is perpetually being filled? Is one way <laughs> of doing that through our morning and evening prayers and praise. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I just thought it's because of relationship. Um, because, you know, when you go about your day and you, you're doing this and you're doing that and you're doing the other, um, you're not necessarily being in relationship mm -hmm. with the Holy Spirit. But when you do pray in the morning and in the evening, you are, you are within you know, you're having that relationship with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Ooh. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Absolutely. It's about relationship with the Holy Spirit and with those seven spirits. Yeah. Right? Like we, we think of the Holy Spirit as one, but the Bible indicates in several places that there's seven. And, you know, Carol is reminding us, I think it's in Isaiah 11, you know, the spirit of wisdom. Remember that verse we read in Daniel yeah, 11 5? Yeah, 11-2. Isaiah 11-2. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Daniel, he always... I don't know if it was morning and evening. I haven't I haven't looked at that. But remember how you weren't supposed to worship. But he always, like clockwork, at the prescribed times, 
he went before the Lord and he praised and he worshiped. And what was found in Daniel, in Daniel 5, the spirit of the gods is in thee, that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. Could it be because he was maintaining that routine of the morning praise and worship and the evening praise and worship? But he did it three times a day. In full I, of no day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't looked at it, so that could be. Yeah, he did it three times a day, yeah. Yeah, but then the third, the, like that would be the morning and the evening for sure, wouldn't it? I'd have to look yes. at it. I need to look mm -hmm. at that. I just threw that one in. It just came to me now. But yeah, you know, and then that altar of incense has that crown of gold, right? That crown of gold. So I think there's important lessons here for us that um, might be worth mm -hmm. meditating on and seeking more wisdom on. Okay, so now I want to move to the table of showbread. So this third piece of furniture within the holy place was also encircled by a crown of gold. And we see that in Exodus 25, 23 to 25, please. Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereto a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make unto it the border of an hand's breadth round about, and thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. Amen. And then verse 30 of Exodus 25, please. And thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. Right, so there we have that word again, before me, right, before the Lord. And how often? Always, Tamid. So do you see how with all three of these items, we have those two phrases, before the Lord and Tamid, perpetually, always. Mm -hmm. Really two key things. <laughs> okay, Leviticus 24, verses 5 to 9, please, Ansel. And thou shalt take fine flour, and bake twelve cakes thereof. Two tenths deals shall be in one cake. And thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before the Lord. And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Every Shabbat he shall set it in order before the Lord continually being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place, for it is most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute, Tamid again, right? Actually not. Um, nope. But we're, that last one, no. But okay. yeah, but the other one, so verse eight, uh, every mm -hmm. Sabbath, he shall set it in order before the Lord mm -hmm. continually. So the continually there is Tamid. And mm -hmm. it's set in order before the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There is so much revelation in here. It is <laughs> uncanny. <laughs> mm -hmm. But first of all, I want to um, I want to make a confession, which is that I have always, always, always thought, and this is why um, we had such difficulty last week on this topic when we were looking at the manna. I've always thought that the showbread, the showbread, represented the word of God. I have changed my mind. I have changed my mind. And uh, I think that you guys, when you were saying last week about the manna representing the word of God, that actually you were correct. <laughs> so well done to Ramesh and Ansel and everybody else who is trying to drive that home because yeah. yeah, it's the manna that represents the word of God. Okay, so just to clarify um, the manna being the word of God, can we please read uh, Deuteronomy 8? Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 6. Every commandment which I command to you 
which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in uh, possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what what uh, what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not so he humbled you allowed you to hunger allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone but man lives every but but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the lord your garments did not wear out you, out on you nor did your foot sw foot swell these 40 years so you should know in your heart that as the man Jesus. sustains his son so the lord our god sustains you therefore you shall keep the commandments of the lord our god to walk in his way and for uh, and to fear him amen 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 so um so you shall consider in your heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. <clears throat> and we see the Lord our God chastening his son, Jesus, in Matthew 4. Uh, so if somebody can read Matthew 4. Just as the Israelites were tried and proven through 40 years of hunger, Jesus was led yes. up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Yes. And that's in Matthew 4. Olive, would you like to read that? Matthew 4, verses mm -hmm. 2 to 4. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread but he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of god amen 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 okay so jesus is obviously quoting deuteronomy 8 <laughs> Okay, so when he says you shall not um, live by bread alone, but by every word, we see in Deuteronomy 8 that that lesson was conveyed by what, Ramesh? Go ahead, teach the teacher, Ramesh. <laughs> the message that you do not live by bread alone was conveyed by? Manna. Manna. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. So what that means, therefore, is that the manna, which we saw was in the Ark of the Covenant, yes. right? And last week I stressed that the manna was there in the Ark of the Covenant to convey the message that Jesus is the way to eternal life. Yes. But we see in Deuteronomy 8 that that manna had a second message. Yes. And the second message is, you do not live by bread alone but by every word that I'm proceeds out of the mouth of yes. the Lord. And who or what is the word, Ramesh? <laughs> Jesus. Hallelujah. Well done, Marjorie. <laughs> we know from John 1 um, and to verse 5 that Jesus is the word of God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Yes. Amen. Verse Amen. four. In him was life, eternal life, and the life was the light, the light of men. And the light shines 
in the darkness, oh, just like a candle, <laughs> and the darkness comprehends it not. Are you seeing how these symbols all interconnect? It is just absolutely uncanny. Okay, so now that I've corrected um, what the manna represents, that it represented those two things, right? It represents the eternal life, and it represents the word of God, who is Jesus. But now that begs the question, what does the bread on the table of showbread represent? Remembrance? Sorry? Remembrance? Remembrance. Um, what? Remembrance. 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 So, okay, go ahead. Where are you getting that from? <laughs> from, from my head. <laughs> um, because, because it says, um, right, um, you know, remember, you, you can't just live by bread alone, but by every word from the mouth of God. So that bread was, and it was 12 loaves, so for each one of the tribes of Israel. So it was kind of a remembrance that this is the bread, this is the word, this is important. That's, um, that's just what I get. I don't know whether it's right or not. <laughs> well, I think it possibly is. Excellent. Okay. But, you know, I, I had a thought. I'm wondering whether the crowns of gold refer to attributes, maybe like righteousness and stuff like that. Yeah? Undoubtedly. And that's what I'm trying to say. Oh, okay. That these, okay. So that's what you've been trying to get at. Okay. And that these attributes are revealed to us through the items within the sanctuary that okay. had mm -hmm. crowns of gold. And that's the mm -hmm. Ark of the Covenant, which we studied last week. Remember, the yes, attribute yes. of the Ark of the Covenant was that it had certain things written in the heart and in the mind. It had the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. It had the lordship of the high priest, who is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it had the manna, which is the knowledge that we have eternal life and that we can know and understand the word of God. We've just learned that another attribute of somebody who has a crown of gold is somebody who is burning incense morning and evening, morning and evening, morning mm. and evening. And now we're looking at the table. The table had a crown of gold. And now we're looking at the attribute of that table and what it represented. So the verse that I had in front of me is Luke 22. Let's read Luke 22. And let's see if there's anything in Luke 22 that tells us anything useful. Luke 22, <laughs> what verse is? Um, 14 to 20. When the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Yes. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Amen, amen, amen. So there's that word remembrance. Very good. <laughs> okay, so we have this imagery. If you look in verse 17 of Luke 22, it says he took the cup and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. And there were 12 apostles with him, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Verse 19, he took the bread, gave thanks, and break it. How many pieces would he have had to break it into? Twelve. Twelve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
And then he says, this is my body. Now, um, if you look in uh, Hebrews 10, it identifies the veil which separated the holy place from the Ark of the Covenant as being the flesh, as being the body of Christ. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here we have this image. This is my body. The bread is his body. And he breaks it into 12 and then says, this is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. He set before me a table in the presence of mine enemies. Mm -hmm. And so we have this table with this bread already prepared, these 12 cakes just ready and willing and able to be shared, to be shared. Shared by whom? And shared by whom when? Okay. Now, so we read in Leviticus 24, verses 8 to 9. So, can we read Leviticus 24, verses 8 to 9 again? Every Shabbat, he shall set it in order. Oh, no. 24, yes. He shall set it in order before the Lord, continually being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place, for it is most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord made by fire, by a perpetual statute. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit right now. But if you look at every single one of these words, it is loaded 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 every shabbat when is shabbat saturday friday um friday evening sunset to saturday evening sunset otherwise known as the seventh day mm -hmm. of the week Okay, mm -hmm. this is not a study on Shabbat. I want to do a separate study on Shabbat. Okay, but it is the mm -hmm. seventh day. Mm -hmm. Every seventh day, he shall order it where? Before the Lord. Before the Lord. Continually. Yeah, okay, let's just deal with each word separately. Before, before the Lord. That phrase mm -hmm. again, before the Lord. Mm-hmm. Continually, as you said, which was what word, Marjorie? Tamid. Tamid. Mm -hmm. Tamid. Tamid. Yeah. Mm. Tamid. Okay. So he shall set these 12 cakes before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel. Being taken from the children of Israel. What well, is the source of this bread? The source of this bread was the children of Israel. Because the bread was the offerings of the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay. The children of Israel gave the flour. The children of Israel gave the oil. Yes. It, yes. It mm -hmm. was their offerings that supplied this bread. Mm -hmm. Being taken from the children of Israel by what? By, by, um, everlasting covenant. By, yes, by an everlasting covenant, yes. <laughs> yes. Hallelujah. Yeah. Which everlasting covenant? Is that Jesus? <laughs> the covenant that he established with the apostles yes. that we are to remember? Yes. Remember in Luke, what did we read? He took the bread, gave thanks, break it, gave it unto them. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant. In my blood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> wow. You have to, you have to really be um, alert and, 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 you know, focused and, um, and connect. Hallelujah. But I'm not done yet. Verse <laughs> oh, nine. Right. Okay, mom. <laughs> it shall be 
Aaron's. Who does Aaron hmm. represent? The Levitical priesthood. Um, the Holy Spirit. Jesus. <laughs> the Levitical priesthood. The Who priest. is Aaron? Who is the Aaron? Sorry, go ahead, Marjorie. So the high priest, priest. So that's Jesus. The no, high just... priest. And who okay. is the high yes. priest? Jesus. Hallelujah. So it shall uh, be Aaron's. <clears throat> it shall be Jesus's. Mm. Oh. And his sons. It says Aaron and his sons. Um, so what does the sons represent? Uh, you uh, tell me, uh, Ansel. Ooh. Who do the sons represent? So it's, uh, um, I'm wondering if that's um, it's in remembrance of Jesus, but does it the sons the, do they represent like um, the pastors, the shepherds, etc.? Is that what it's saying? It's trying to say. Um, I'm just having. I don't know. Is thoughts. that what the Bible says, Ansel? It says and his sons. So it could mean priests. And it, how do you know that, Marjorie? Um. You because I am told, I am told through the word that I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. I'm just trying to find the verse. John 1. John, John 1. 1. John 1. We read verses 1 to 5. Let's continue. John 1. Okay. Verses 12, sorry, 6 to 12. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came from the witness to bear witness of the light that shall through him uh, might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light which gives light to every man who comes into the world. He was the, he was in the world and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many has received him, to them he gave the right to become a children of God. Children? <laughs> it is not children of God. Marjorie, what does verse 10, no, sorry, verse 12 say, Marjorie? But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Which, Which were, born. were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh yes. and dwelt among mm -hmm. us, dwelt among <laughs> us, and we <laughs> beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth so um going back to where we were how we got to john was we were looking at leviticus 24 okay so we yeah. had aaron and his sons yeah leviticus 24 verse 9 it shall be so this is the bread the mm -hmm. bread which was taken from the children of israel by an everlasting covenant <laughs> It shall be Aaron's and his sons. So who are the sons in the New Testament? We are. And they shall eat it where? In the holy place. In the holy place. And where is the holy place? In us. We are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For it is most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord made by fire, a perpetual statute. Now, this is where I want to look at that word perpetual, because this one is slightly different. OK, this one is not tamid. The word that is um, used perpetual here is actually another word, which is olam, O-W-L-A-M. OK, olam. Olam, OK. Unlike Tamid, which was perpetual, like stretching in perpetuity, okay, this is a slightly different, and it means forever, always, continuous. It is kind of the same, but it's everlasting, indefinite, unending future 
for all of eternity. For all of eternity. That's what Olam means. Okay. So what is it that is supposed to take place forever? Leviticus 24, right? Verse 8. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord, Tamid. They shall eat it in the holy place perpetually as a as a as a perpetual everlasting statute okay so what is it that is supposed to take place perpetually the eating of the bread the eating of the bread when um, and so every long. sabbath every sabbath um, not every month Sorry. Not every month, no. not every first day, not every second day, not every third day, not every fourth day, not every fifth day, not every sixth day, every seventh, every seventh day. day, perpetually as an everlasting, forever and ever and ever, all of eternity statute. I wonder when that statute was taken away. I will leave that as a rhetorical um, can question. I, can I just ask <laughs> Marjorie, yes. You know when when Jesus was walking um through and his disciples ate some of the ears of um wheat um along the way and the, the um Pharisees were saying, Oh, you know, how awful, you know, this is a Sabbath, you're letting your disciples eat and stuff. And he said, Well, what about David? When David and his people were hungry, they went and took the showbread and ate it. But that's, actually, got, that's got two kind of meanings to it now in my mind. <laughs> please elaborate. Please elaborate. <laughs> well, because, because I thought, well, you know, they're hungry. They just took the bread. But now it means they were hungry for the word of God, basically. And so mm. they went and ate mm. the word, which is Jesus. Um, is that whoa? <laughs> There's such a lot, such a it's so exciting, honestly. But also, <laughs> mm. you're right because you know those ears of corn and that could be ground down mm. into the flat flour, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But also that actually they were doing what they were supposed to be doing on the Sabbath, mm. which yeah. was sitting or not sitting, but having a meal. With, with Jesus, yes, mm. yeah, <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh -huh. And thank you for bringing that up, because yeah, I wouldn't have had that if it hadn't been for you, Marjorie. So thank you. <laughs> That's oh. beautiful. Can I just ask you? Mm -hmm. Is that communion? I believe so. And uh, yeah. Well, you know, people say you can take it all the time now. Take it three times a day as a medicine. And yeah. Stuff. And I'm not trying to go against that. Mm. But what I am saying is that there is a commandment here. There is a statute here that does specify a particular time and place. Uh -huh. Okay. So I'm not mm. saying you can't take it other times. That's mm. not what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. In most of in uh, most of the Christian, they will uh, take Lord's Supper in once in a month. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, I want. I wonder where they got that instruction from. But right, God, I I give Lord's Supper every uh, Sunday. That's wonderful. <laughs> well, but Sunday isn't the seventh day. Anyway, <laughs> we're we can. Get, that's a separate study. That's a separate study. Okay. But I do, I do just want to point out that we are trying to discover what are the attributes of somebody yes. who has a crown of gold. <laughs> yes, and, and really we don't keep the Shabbat on, on Sunday at all because we're too busy doing things. You need, the, the Bible instructs us not to do any work, not to do anything, but on to meditate day? on the Lord. Huh? On, the first, on the first day? On the Friday. <laughs> on the seventh day. Yeah, the seventh day on the Friday and the Saturday from evening to morning, from evening to evening. Can I ask you then, um, are you 
are you saying that it that we should then um celebrate the Sabbath on or keep the Sabbath on on Friday <laughs> evening to Saturday evening? Or are you saying that um or are you saying that Sunday's okay as long as you keep what you consider the Sabbath? Which one? I'm saying that the Lord has called a certain day holy. Okay. Those who want to be in Christ obey the Lord's commandments. Mm -hmm. I'm just pointing out what the word of God says. <laughs> and hoping that as the light shines, mm -hmm. that it will shine in our hearts. Mm. That it will shine in our hearts and bring us revelation because that's what this book is all about, isn't it? This book is all mm -hmm. about revelation, the mm -hmm. revelation of Jesus, the Christ. Yeah. And the light is shining in the darkness and more and more people are responding to that light. Anyway, take that as you will. Meditate. Mm -hmm. Do your own study. So I think... What I mean, as I say, this was sort of this revelation was sort of developing as I was going through. So I can't say that it's absolutely complete. But based on what we've read, do you guys want to put forward some ideas of what the table of showbread represents symbolically <coughs> in terms of our communion with God, our relationship with God? Any ideas? The bread and body of Christ? Yep. The body of Christ. Absolutely. And remember, the veil was his flesh, right? He's, and he broke his flesh. And then that helps us to go into the holy place. So, yes, the body of Christ. Absolutely. <laughs> which is very different from the word of God, which was what I always thought it was. The body of mm. Christ. Hallelujah. What else? It's, so it's a new covenant guys i think did you say the new covenant yes new covenant uh, with lord jesus christ um being the sacrificial lamb of humanity of humanity mm. humanity yeah absolutely but yeah that he that when he when he when he when his body was nailed to that cross absolutely this is my body given for you like absolutely sacrifice. the sacrifice, sacrifice the sacrificial lamb yeah 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 absolutely and then of course the other thing about the imagery which isn't necessarily in the wording but Aaron and his sons think about it every sabbath they came together they all sat there and had a meal yes didn't they and i think that therefore, actually, because Ramesh, as you just said, this represents Jesus's body. This is Jesus's body. But who is the body? We are the body. Us. Like, do you see how every single one of these symbols not only represent Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit, but also represent us. It's absolutely uncanny, absolutely uncanny. So I pray, I pray that that study really blessed you. I pray that it gave you lots to think about. I pray that it gave you revelation. I know that as I'm doing these studies, I'm getting so much revelation. Things, you know, things that I didn't know last week. You know, we covered it in the teaching today. Things that I didn't know last week have been opened up to me by the Holy Spirit as I look into this tabernacle of Moses, as I look into the Old Testament, as I look into the book of Exodus, as I look into the book of Leviticus. Just to review, therefore, what we've talked about today, um, we've been looking at the crowns. Okay, we've been looking at the crowns that the Church of Smyrna and the Church of Philadelphia get. And we um, looked back at the Tabernacle of Moses, and we've discovered that within the holy place, within the sanctuary, there are three items. One of those is the candlestick, which holds the seven perpetually burning lamps, which we believe represent the seven spirits of God. And of course, who are the candlesticks? 
the candlesticks are the churches, the churches are the ecclesia, and the ecclesia are us. Okay, so the uh, candlesticks are the church, they're us, and we are perpetually burning with the oil and the light of the Holy Spirit. And within um, that sanctuary, there were two other items, both of which had crowns of gold. And so one of those is the altar of incense, which burns with holy, holy, holy incense. And that incense burns morning and evening, morning and evening, morning and evening. As the priests, as the sons of Aaron, in other words, the sons of God, morning and evening, refill, refill and replenish the oil within their lamps. How? By raising up prayers, the prayers of the saints, and by lifting up hands in praise and worship. And we've talked about whether or not possibly it is those who do this morning and evening, praising and worship and prayer, who are given those crowns of gold. And then we looked at the table of showbread and we discovered that contrary to what I believed before, the showbread does not necessarily mean or refer to the word of God because that was highlighted by the manna, which is in the Ark of the Covenant. But the showbread, these 12 cakes of bread represent the 12 apostles. It could also represent the 12 tribes of Israel. That is also a possibility. I'm not saying that that's not the possibility at all. But that this idea of communing, Aaron, the high priest, communing with the sons of Aaron, the sons of God, and communing and sharing that bread, that bread that represents the body of Christ that was given for all of us, that was broken for him so that the veil, which is his body, could be broken so that we could enter into the Holy of Holies and commune with God. And then we looked at the reality, the reality that that showbread was replaced every Sabbath, perpetually every Sabbath, for everlasting, for all of eternity. That is a perpetual statute for all of eternity that Aaron and his sons will commune together and break bread together and eat the body of Christ in this communal meal every Sabbath. And so we asked ourselves, does that mean that those, those who share and partake in this new covenant, this new and living way into the holy place by eating of the body of Christ, who are the body of Christ, who are the sons of God, that when we partake of this communion on the Sabbath, because it was perpetually on the Sabbath, not any old day, but on the Sabbath, that those are the ones who are given those crowns of gold. Something for you to think about, something for you to meditate on, something for you to do your own studies in and discover the truth according to the word of God. So I pray that that blessed you. Um, as I say every week, we hold this Bible study on a Tuesday at two o'clock UK time. Everybody is welcome to attend. All you need to do is just reach out, uh, just send me an email via the end times watchman at yahoo.com email address, and we'll send you the link. And then you can uh, share with us in the Bible study. But if you don't want to participate live, then please, 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 please do leave your comments um, because, yeah, we want to we want to share in the revelation that you have and we want to partake of that oil <laughs> of that light. So please put your comments in the comment section, whether you agree or disagree. That's OK. Uh, we learn we learn from all comments and um, and I pray that you will subscribe to the channel. I pray that you will hit the notifications button so that you'll be notified every time that we post a new Bible study. I pray that you will like um, the Bible study uh, lessons or the Bible study uh, videos that you watch. And I pray that you'll share, share the link, post it on your own channels, whatever, whatever you need to do to spread the word. We'd like um, everybody to uh, really partake in the joy that is this End Times Prophecy Bible Study. So thank you so much, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.